this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless peace. This gift, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Still on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the depth of Christ I live. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. An unbroken chain of salvation, amen. Hallelujah. to be praised. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you, Jesus. So good to be back in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Number two. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, here we go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bob.
What's that name? What's that name, church? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, join me in prayer, brethren. Oh, we are in the great throne room of our God, our Lord, and our Savior, our King, our Father. Thank you for all you are, great God. You love us the way you do. It's so, so amazing to me. So amazing. Hallelujah. Yes. You are a great God. Adam failed, Lord God. Moses failed, David failed, hallelujah. But we have the one, the true, the living God man, Jesus, my Lord, my savior, my brother, and king, hallelujah. Everything is put over under your feet, everything. All authority given to you by the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Thank you, Father, for sending him. Thank you, Father, for sending the Holy Spirit that you didn't leave us alone. You were all in us and through us and around us and changing us. Lord, help us see this world the way you see it, Lord God. Help us act and move and think and breathe the way Jesus walked this earth, Lord God. Thank you so much for all that you're doing for us. Thank you for our destiny, Lord God, that we would be with you forevermore the way we intended from the very beginning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So much joy. How can I not praise you? You created me. You created everything around me. You created the, the world, the air for me to breathe, to live. Not only just living now, but living as you were intended for me to live with you forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. My purpose is to be with you. Our purpose is to be with you forevermore. Hallelujah, thank you, God. You just didn't save us from the hellfire. We're grateful for that. Hallelujah. You saved us for your, to be intimate with you, to be in your presence, to be the way we were meant to be from the very beginning. Thank you, God. We turn this whole service over to you in honor of who you are. You have prepared a wonderful meal for us. You have done wondrous things in our pastor here, Lord God. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his family. Bless him in his word that you give to us today. Bless us in the hearing of this word and bless us as we leave this building to, to act in this word that, to, to change, that it changes us, that we are now more like your son, like we were intended to be. We were intended to be molded in, image, in the image and likeness of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. We want to walk out this building changed forevermore. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Good morning. 
What a glorious day. What a beautiful day. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to see all of you this morning. I'd like to welcome all of, the, uh, all of you who are watching uh, on Facebook, YouTube, or streaming live on our website. We are blessed and honored to have you with us this morning. Welcome to Church Life. I'd like to start out with some praise reports. And so we are going to say congratulations to the following FOCC family members who are celebrating their birthday in October. And they are as follow. Eunice Johnson, Joanna Douglas, Pat England, Ruth Murphy, Jeremy Tidmore, Lauren Price, Kezia Murphy, and our pastor, Lloyd Garrett. So congratulations, blessings to all of you. May you have many more. Wonderful. Uh, congratulations also to the following FOCC couples who are celebrating their anniversary in October. And they are Hampton and Joanne Haywood. Their anniversary was on Friday, actually, the 1st of October. And Teresa and Samuel Asari. So blessings for them, and may they have many more happy years together. Also, I'd like to uh, go over previously announced prayer requests so that we can keep the following people in our prayers, remember them uh, during the week uh, as we are lifting them up in prayer. Uh, the first one is prayers are requested for Christopher Scott, the nephew of Mrs. Helen Hill. Christopher has been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and will be undergoing chemotherapy uh, treatment soon. Please pray for his healing and recovery. We also have a prayer from our website. Please pray for Pamela to walk again and to be restored to perfect health. Please pray that she will be able to attend church again. Please pray that when she is well again, she will find a good church home. These are um, also uh, previously announced prayer updates we are uh, going to be talking about now. Uh, Maureen Griffin had a CAT scan this past week, and, was de and it was determined that the cancer has spread to other parts of her body. She is leaning toward ending any further treatment. She is at peace, and thank you for your prayers uh, for God's will to be done in her life. Please continue to keep all of these uh, in your prayers. Also, Joseph Hill Jr.'s condition continues to improve. Praise God for that. He is no longer being treated for MRSA, and his therapy is going well. Please keep him in your prayers. Also, Deborah DeSasso wishes to thank everyone for their prayers on her behalf regarding her endoscopy. The procedure went without a hitch, and no abnormalities were found. Praise God for that. We are so thankful for that as well. All that God is doing, we are so grateful and thankful for. We do have a new prayer update. Kay Price requests your continued prayers for her brother-in-law, Vincent Price. Vincent is scheduled to undergo endovascular stent grafting surgery on Wednesday, October 6th, to repair an abnormal aortic aneurysm and keep it from rupturing. His aneurysm is growing quickly. An abdominal aortic aneurysm occurs when an area of the aorta becomes very large or balloons out. The larger the aneurysm, the more likely it is to break open or rupture. This can be life-threatening. The aorta is the largest blood vessel in the body and is responsible for transporting blood from the heart to the rest of the body. The abnormal aorta is the main blood vessel in the abdomen that transmits blood to the organs within the abdomen and to the lower limbs. Please also, please also pray 
that God will bless Vincent to stop smoking and that his prostate cancer will remain in remission. The Price family is so grateful for your continued prayers. So please, family, remember uh, Vincent, as I said, as, as well as all the others in your prayers uh, this week. It is amazing what God has done and how he has created the human body to function as it does. That just kind of gives us an example of how important the aorta is. Also under general announcements, advisory council meeting. There will be an advisory council meeting on Sunday, October 10th at 3 p.m. The meeting will be on Zoom. The invitation, minutes, and agenda will be sent out this week. The sermon today is entitled, God's Golden Chain of Salvation, Part 2, which will be given by our senior pastor, Lloyd Garrett. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. <laughs> One thing we do know, we, we know that all things work together. ourselves in situations that we cannot understand and when we search for explanations in love God says this is my Life, we shall 
Good morning, family. Good to see everybody today, and welcome to those of you who haven't been here for a little while. We're still here, still in the house of the Lord. It's always good to see anyone when they come back, even if it's for a time or two, and eventually, God willing, we'll be back to normal. Don't you look forward to that? <laughs> Praise God. But in the, in the meantime, we know God has everything under control. No need to fret, no need to worry, no need to concern yourself, because God will see that everything work together for good. Amen. Amen. Last week, uh, I started a sermon by saying that, oh, before I move forward, let me welcome those of you who are also on uh, watching us on our website, on Facebook, on YouTube. We are honored to have you with us as well. Um, <laughs> it's, and also, thank you so much, Deborah, for the worship. And I mentioned that Hampton's going to do a disappearing act. You know, he celebrated his anniversary on two days ago. Uh, Joanne said, I'm out of here. I'm going to go celebrate now. <laughs> so now he has to catch up with her. She already had two days of celebration. Now he's got to catch up. So uh, <laughs> congratulations, my friend. As I was about to say, last week I started a sermon uh, by saying that someone once said that if I were on a desert island <clears throat> and I could only have one book, it would be the Bible. I hope everybody feels that way. <laughs> I hope you have some, don't have a novel you want to, magazine you want to read, but I hope you would have the Word of God. And he went on to say that if I could only have one book in the Bible, it would be the book of Romans. If I could only have one chapter in the book of Romans, it would be chapter 8. If I could only have, I said that if you, I could only have one verse in chapter 8, of the book of Romans, it would be verse 28. Verse 28. The same verse that we heard in the worship today. All things work together for good. I want us to read verse 28 down to verse 30 again, because this is part two of the sermon, and I'm going to recap some of the things we talked about together, blend it all together so you can see this wonderful, wonderful promise wonderful gift that God gives to every single one of us through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's read it, digest it. Let it marinate in your heart and in your mind what God has done for you. It says in Romans 8, verse 29 down to verse 30, and we know, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That in, in itself is enough to lift your heart, lift your spirit. Because when you're going through something, you like to know that somebody has this mess under control. And somebody say amen to that. Amen. When you're having difficulty on the job, with your health, at home, with your children, with your spouse, you like to know that somebody, because you know you don't have it under control, you like to know that somebody has this all under control and it's working together for my good. And he goes on to say in verse 29, and Paul is the writer of this hope chapter, in fact, the entire book. He says, for those God foreknew, he, that is God, also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, if you haven't picked up on it already, we're talking about you, my brother, my sister. We're talking about you. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, that is Christ, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And in verse 30, he says, And those he predestined, he also called. 
those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. That is a beautiful passage, a wonderful passage, an encouraging passage of what God is doing in your life right now. You may not be aware of it. You may be oblivious to it. You may not even feel it. But I'm here to tell you that God is doing a magnificent work in you. And the end result, the final destination of this journey that you're on is glorification. You're on that journey. You're on that plane. And there's no way of getting off. Because God started it and God will finish it. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you so much for who you are, for being the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you for being the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you, God in heaven, for starting a good work in us and for seeing it to completion. Thank you, God, that you have not left our salvation up to us. Because, Lord, there's no question about it. We would blow it. We will blow it. We would have blown it long ago. So you did not leave anything to chance. You didn't leave our salvation in human hands. Our track record isn't that good. Our, we, we, we mess too many things up. We don't always do things for our good. But Holy Father, we thank you that the things that you do will always turn out for our good and for your glory. And especially this wonderful, amazing gift we call salvation. Thank you, God in heaven, for what you're doing in our lives right now. Here we're talking about something that you have already started and completed. And here, when we talk about what's going on in time, because you're outside of time, in time, we are going through the process. But in eternity, it's already been completed. Thank you for what you are doing, God, and have done. Thank you that even though it says we, uh, uh, he also glorified, we have already been glorified in eternity through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for this wonderful gift. Thank you for your word today, and as we study it, as we reflect on it, as we meditate on it, May it truly impact our lives in a fresh, new way. Thank you so much for all things. Remove me out of the way and just speak to us, your people, today from this word of encouragement. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Together we say amen. Amen. So Romans 8, 28, and I'm reading today from the NIV, New International Version, because not all versions say it the same way, because oftentimes when I read Romans 8, 28, I would get the impression that uh, somehow or the other, no matter what I go through, is going to be all right. Things are going to work out. But life doesn't really work that way when you stop and think about it. Things don't always work out. We have bad things that happen in our lives, don't we? You know, we have sicknesses. We have illnesses. We lose jobs. We have bad jobs. We have bad marriages. We have uh, bad children. I know, because I was one. So we, those bad things do happen even to us. But I'm here to tell you that everything God touches from beginning to end turns out good. So that's what we're here to learn today. We're not so much focusing on what we do because you're not really, uh, you're just a participating, you're participating in this equation. We're looking in at it from God's point of view, what he is doing in your life even before you are a thought in your mother's or daddy's mind. Even before this earth was created, God started a process for your glorification. He started it long ago. So Romans 8, 28 tells us an amazing truth that God, God, he's the, he is the star of this verse. Not you, not me. God works all things for good, for your good, for my good, for believers' good. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 
Now, this verse teaches us, I'm just recapping, for those of you who were not here or didn't hear it, this verse teaches us two amazing or important truths. Number one, it teaches us what God does. And set number two, it teaches us who he does it for. So what does God do? What does God do? What is it that God does? Well, it says here that God works for the good. God works for the good. Is that what you get out of it? That God is busy, he's working, and everything he does is good. We see that just by reading the creation account, don't we? God said it was good. God is always working for the good. So Paul says that this is something that we know, at least we ought to know, we know. He says that we know that in all things God works for the good. Now, we don't think, in other words. Uh, we don't guess. We uh, don't cross our fingers and hope it works for the best. It says that we know that in all things God works for the good. So how do we know that? Well, we know this for two important reasons. First of all, we know it because God is sovereign. Does everybody know what God is sovereign means? It means that he's in control of the situation, okay? He's flying the plane. He is sovereign. And number two, God is good. We say God is good and all the time. So what does that mean when we say God is good all the time? It's no brainer. It means that God is what? good all the time. All you have to think about what you're saying. He is good all the time. He's not good sometimes, and sometimes he's bad. He's good all the time. Do we all agree with that? Do we all agree that God is in control? Even when things look like they're out of control, God is still in control. Even in the midst of a pandemic, God is still in control. Never forget those fundamental truths. God is sovereign, and God is good. Now, which means all things are under his control, okay? He wants only good for his children. The God who is in control of your life and my life, he only wants good things for you and for me. So what we're learning today is that God's actions flow right from his character. His character is he's sovereign, he's in control, and he is good. So his actions flow from that. I quoted last week a man named Thomas Brooks who wrote, God, in that he is good, uh, can give nothing nor do nothing but that which is good. Our God is good. You know, if you can just get your mind soaked in that, we're just, we, you're just filled with my, I don't care what you say, I know God is good. Some people can't get their minds wrapped in it. Well, how can you say God is good all the time? You just got to first of all believe it. And then when you start believing it, you will see it. Yeah, but if you are a negative thinker, you say, no, I can't be good. But my life is a wreck. That's, you know, yeah, your life may be a, a wreck, but if you are in Christ, it's going to turn out, that wreck's going to turn out pretty good yeah. for you in his glory. And so we know this to be true, that God works for the good. Now, this does not mean the same as when people say everything works out in the end. That's not, that's not what we're saying. Things don't magically work for good on their own. It just doesn't happen that way. Paul is saying that God, who's the star of this verse, is the one who works all things out for good. Now, our faith is in God, not in things, okay? Okay? That's what we need to get from this verse. It doesn't mean that all things are good. There's a lot of bad in the world, as I said earlier. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of evil in this world. And there will be. In fact, it will get worse and worse and worse. Uh, but that does not change the one who's in control. In fact, God knew and knows it will all get worse and worse and worse. But that doesn't change who God is, does it? It doesn't change his character. It doesn't change his actions flowing from his character. So there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of evil. Paul doesn't say all things are good. What he says is that God works all things for good. Everybody with me? Okay. Now, I didn't get much. I mean, I, I, I kind of looked to see if you got me. But I, that, maybe it's good to give it again to, see, to ask you again to see if you got it now. Okay. That means even the bad things that happen in your life. If you're a Christian, like suffering, 
sickness and sin, that still works for the good. Now, I don't have to turn to it, but Joseph is an example. We know his story. Joseph said of his brothers, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for what? So God could take an evil situation, flip it around for his good, for your good, to his glory. So we know he can do it. How about Job? That's another situation. That was bad. How sick was this man? How messed up? How jacked up was he health-wise? But if you read chapter 42, it says a man was blessed more in the end than he was in the beginning. Does God work all things for good? If he did it for Joseph, he'll do it for you. So that's what happens in the case of suffering uh, and sickness. How about sin? Uh, sin is pretty bad, isn't it? I'm here to tell you that God can even bring good out of sin. Yes, he can. He can bring good out of sin. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. The greatest sin ever committed in the history of the world was putting Jesus, your Savior, my Savior, the perfect Son of God on the cross. Yet out of the worst sin, God brought the greatest good. How do I know that? I'm looking at it. Your salvation is because of God taking that worst sin. Turn it around for your salvation. Is God good or not? Yes, he is. So, even every bad thing from your past, every trial that you are going through in your present, and everything or anything that might happens to, happen to you in your future, uh, whatever Satan or this world might throw at you, God takes it and he will turn it around for your good. That's the God we serve. So what does God do? God works all things for good. Second thing that we need to learn from that verse in verse 28 is who does he do it for? Who does he do it for? He does it for believers. Raise your hand if you are a believer. I mean, raise your hand high if you really are a believer. Because I want to know who I'm talking to today. I hope I have a whole room of believers. Because if you're not a believer, you're not going to like what we're going to say. Yeah, but, I, but, but I can, I, I can su suggest that, uh, that if you're not a believer, you better start believing something. Okay? So we're talking to believers. So who is he talking to? He's talking to believers. This is only a promise for believers. Those who reject Jesus Christ in this life have no promise from God that he will work all things for their good. You say, my pastor, I know some unbelievers who seem to have some pretty good things going on in their life. It is, the end result won't be good, I guarantee you. It will not be good. You see, this verse, passage that we're looking at tells you the end result of everything. Okay, from beginning to end. I mean, it's all inclusive. And if you are not a believer, it's not going to end well, okay? It won't end well. Now, it, 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 it may mess up before you get there, but one way or the other, it will not be good in the end. But if you are a believer, the outcome, the end result will always be good. So, uh, if you reject Jesus Christ, it's not going to end well. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that a part from Jesus Christ, we will face eternal death or eternal separation from God. That's the end result. That is not good. And that is not good for anyone. So Paul uses two phrases to describe a believer. A believer. I'm going quickly because this is a recap. A believer. Believers, who, who, what makes you a believer? A believer is one who loves God. A believer, number two, is one who's been called according to his purpose. That's what it says in verse 28, right? Those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So he's not describing two different two types of people, or two different people. There's some who love God and some who are called according to his purpose. He's describing the same person. He's just looking at it from two points of view. And oftentimes when you talk about salvation, so often we tend to look at it from one point of view, but we need to stop and look at it from God's point of view. Because, oh, and because God's point of view gives you a whole new picture. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at salvation from God's point of view. 
We often look at it, well, here's what I need to do to be saved. You're wasting your time. You can't do anything to get saved. How many of you are doing, how many are doing good at that? We're not, we don't do well at our own salvation. It's a God thing. So, but we're looking at it from God's point of view. So a believer is one who loves God. A believer is one who's called according to his purpose. The same person, we're just looking at it from two different points of view. Those who love God are those who've been called according to his purpose. Those who've been called according to his purpose are those who love God. Both phrases describe a believer. Now, the first phrase is from our point of view. We love God. The second phrase is from God's point of view, called according to his purpose. So who are Christians? Who are believers? There are people who love God. There are people who are called according to his purpose. Same person. So if you are a believer, you love God. How do I know that? Because Jesus said, if you don't love God, you're not a Christian. You know what the Bible says? How can you say you, how can you, say you, 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 you got to love God to be a Christian? You just can't, you can't say, I'm a Christian, but I don't love God. Well, you just cancel yourself out right there. So you love God. And by the way, how can, you can't even love God on your own, can you? Why do, how can we love God? Because he, I always like to check to see if you know your Bible. Because he first loved us. So we are responding to his love for us, right? And I mentioned how that, that's, how, that's what marriage is all about. It teaches us how God's love flows. It flows, wives generally love the man. You know, if a man showers you with love, say, yeah, I know, I, yeah, I want to marry because I love, he loves me. We respond to him. So we, we love God. And then it says, uh, we are also a called people, a called people. I'm explaining that in a minute. God called us to himself. He called us to Jesus. He called us to salvation. And we are called according to his purpose. Let me just add, his divine purpose. Now that word purpose, it's an interesting word, comes from a word that means planned in advance. Plan in advance. Once again, God is sovereign, and nothing can stop God's plan or purpose from being fulfilled. Nothing. There's nothing that anyone, you, me, or anybody else, the devil, you're not going to stop God's plan because God is sovereign. Now, this verse tells you that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what happens in your life, past, present, or future, God is still in control, and God is working for your good, no matter what. God takes even the worst things in your life, family, and works it for your good and for his glory. That's what he does. I mean, uh, there's a scripture, I can't remember where it is, that talks about even a broken flask, he will not throw away. That tells me that no matter how messed up your life may be, God doesn't throw you away. God's not going to discard you. He's not going to kick you to the curb. You mess up too much. You don't know God. You, you know, I don't, I I, I don't want to go to church because my life is too messed up. That doesn't mean anything to God. God can fashion your life and you, come, and you will become a, a shining example to other people because of what God can do in your life. So God can take even the worst things in your life and work it for your God, good and his glory. And that means in Christ, you are safe. In Christ, you are secure and nothing can harm you in Christ Jesus. God works all things for your good. Now, that's just the first verse. That's just verse 28. And it states a general principle here. General principle that God works all things for good for believers. That's a principle. We've quoted that. Many people have that verse committed to, men, to memory. But the next two verses, Paul takes this general principle and applies it to the specific subject of salvation. He, in other words, he shows this, if you could put up that golden chain or link, uh, Jackie, he shows us what, how this process works. 
He shows us step by step how God works out his good purpose of salvation in the life of the believer. It begins with foreknowledge. He foreknew you. He predestined you. He called you. He justified you. And he glorified you. This is what's happening behind the scene from God's point of view. You say, well, Pastor, I don't, I don't, I, I, when did he predestine you? Oh, before you were even born. Amen. Okay. Well, Pastor, well, when did he foreknew? Before you were even born. In fact, before this earth was even created. Amen. He says, I want Mary. Now, that kind of blows your mind a little bit, doesn't it? I want Sylvia. I want D. Uh, I'll take Lloyd, too, I guess. But <laughs> no. Before you were, this world was even created, he foreknew you and he predestined you. We'll look at that in just a moment. But th there's five steps in this process. Let's read verse 29 and 30 again. For those God foreknew, he, that is God, also predestined. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, uh, the son, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he, that is God, also called. Those he called, he, being God, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And by the way, before I go further, if you really just stop and think about it, family, since salvation is a gift from God, and since it's God's good purpose to give you eternal life, why would God start something he's not going to finish? That just doesn't make sense, does it, when you stop and think about it? Because God never fails at anything. Do we fail? You bet. But that's why it's so good to know that God is in the mix here to straighten out our mess. And he does it every single day. Now notice in our verses, verse 29 through 30, that God is the subject here. That's why when I said he, I pointed out that's God, it's God, it's God. As I said, he's the star of this passage. He's the subject of all of these verbs. When we talk about foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified, he is the, uh, the subject of all of these verbs. Uh, verbs. God is the one who does every single one of these things. The work of salvation, my brothers and sisters, is a God thing. God is doing it. He's doing it. Uh, and it, it's only, and you may say, well, Pastor, well, what am I doing? You're being molded and fashioned and conforming to the image of his son. He, 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 but see, some say, well, where is sanctification and all that? Well, that's what you're going through. You're, you're being molded and fashioned to the image of the son. Sanctification is in there. But I want you to understand who's driving the bus, okay? Right. Who's driving the bus. So the work of salvation is all God doing. And it's only for us to repent of our sins and believe the gospel. And then all of a sudden, we're gonna, God moves it in from there. He takes it from there. In fact, he's already, <laughs> he's, already started, uh, he's already started this flight. So first, these are all things that God does. Let's repeat. All five of these actions, if you could put the chain back up, Jackie, all five of the actions are applied to the same group of people, you, me, other believers. Do you see that little word also is repeated over and over again? Paul isn't talking about five groups or five things that God does for five different groups of people. All five things that God does for one group of people those who, are believe, who believe in Christ are saved. These verses are often called the golden chain of salvation. I call it God's golden chain of salvation because he's the one that set this will in motion. He's the one that set this process in motion in your life and in mine. Uh, and one action automatically follows the other. If he started it, he's going to finish it from beginning to end. You're going to go from being for, uh, having been born on by God you're going to take it all the way to glorification, all the way to being glorified. Anybody, can you give me another word for being glorified? Where would you be when you're glorified? 
That's it. Would you prefer the word heaven? Okay. But well, either way, that's where, you, that's where you're going to end up, okay? So if God starts the first action for you, then you know he will do the second and the third and all the rest. Because he doesn't say, you know what, let me just try that. I must, I'm going to, I foreknow, I foreknew Lloyd, but I predestined, but I'm going to leave it up to him for the rest. How insane would that be? Why would God leave my salvation in my hands? I would have blown it long ago, family. I would, in fact, I would have blown it at birth. You know why? Because every single one of us, of, of us were born fallen into sin. Okay? We're all messed up. So he couldn't leave it to us. So let's look at these five unbreakable links in the golden chain of salvation. First link is God foreknew you. Foreknew you. Now, that's how verse 29 starts out. For God, uh, for those God foreknew. That word is translated, uh, that translated foreknew here can have several different meanings in the word of God depending on how it's used. Uh, when it's used by human beings, it simply means you knew something in advance. But it's not always reliable, is it? You know, we can say, well, I know the sun's going to come up tomorrow, and lo and behold, we could have a cloudy day. Our foreknowledge isn't that good. But in the Bible, when the Bible uses this term uh, or phrase or this word with God, it means something more than just knowing something before it happens. When used with God in Scripture, it carries the idea of not only knowing but choosing. Choosing. Let me give you an example from Acts chapter 2, verse 23, about Jesus. When Peter preached to the crowd about Jesus in Jerusalem, he told them in Acts 2, 23, this man who was handed over, referring to Jesus, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God did not simply know in advance that Jesus would go to the cross. God chose Jesus to go to the cross. It was a done deal. It was a done deal. Acts 2.23 says Jesus went to the cross according to God's purpose. Can you thwart God's purpose? No, you cannot. If it was God's purpose for Jesus to go to the cross, what is Jesus going to do? Go to the cross. Now, Romans 8, 28 says that we are called according to God's purpose. Uh, that word for no is used in both passages. Acts 2, 23 uh, the same word, we use foreknowledge in, Acts, in Romans 8.28. Foreknowledge works differently with God than with people because God is sovereign, that is, he's in control of the situation. God foreknew Jesus would go to the cross because it was God's purpose for Jesus to go to the cross. God foreknew you because as Romans 8, 28 says, you are called according to what? His purpose. His purpose. You're here for a purpose. So when Paul says, God foreknew you, it means more than God knew in advance that you would be a believer. It means God chose you. He handpicked you. In fact, when you think about it, it can't mean merely knowing in advance because remember Paul is only talking about what God does for the believer. Everyone whom God foreknows in verse 29 ends up in glory or heaven in verse 30. Everyone. God knows all people in advance. But not all people go to heaven. Okay? So when the Bible says God foreknew you, he foreknew you. Pastor Tom, Jennifer, 
Vivian, Deborah, he knew you in advance. Which means, and he, and, and he called you for, you were chosen by him. Handpicked by him. So when the Bible says God foreknew you, it also means that God chose you. You might wonder, wonder well, why did God choose me? <laughs> I mean, why didn't he choose uh, my, my cousin who, you know, went to prison for murdering a man? <laughs> why didn't he choose him? Was it because we were better than others? Better looking than others? Richer than others? Smarter than others? Why did God choose you? Well, there's only one reason. There's only one reason. And it's the only reason that makes sense. You know why God chose you? It's because he loves you. God chose you because he loves you. You know that scripture says not many wise are called, not many noble. God chose you because he loves you. Now you may say, well, Pastor, doesn't God love everybody? Well, yes, he does. But God has a special love for you, a special love. A, a, he has a special love for his people. We're talking about the church now. God chose you because he loves you in a special way. It's similar to what God said of Israel in Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8. It says that God said to Israel, through Moses. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more in number than other, other people, but because God loved you. Once again, does God love everyone? Yes, but he has a special love for Israel, and that's why he chose her to be his special people. Well, I'm here to tell you that God has a special love for his church, his people, for you. The Bible says in Deut uh, Jeremiah 31, 3, he says, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. What does the word everlasting mean? Eternal. That means eternity past, eternity future. That means how long has God loved you? <laughs> Forever. You say, how can he love me? I haven't been here. I've only been here for 30 years. He loved you before you were even born. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, that's an incredible story. Even before you were even thought of, a figment of your parents' imagination, God loved you. That means that God loved you from the very beginning and will never, ever stop loving you. Now, why did God choose you? Because God chose you because he loves you. That's it, nothing else. Ephesians, uh, well, here's another question. When did he choose you? When did he choose you? I kind of hinted at it. Ephesians 1, 4 says this. For he chose us. That's you and me. You. He chose you. Me. In him before the creation of the world. You may say, Pastor, I can't get my mind wrapped around this. That's all right. I know you can't because we're finite. We can only get our mind, we can barely get our mind wrapped around our 60, 70 years. But we're talking eternity talk here now, okay? You know we can't get our minds wrapped around that. How can he love me before he even created the world? I wasn't even around. In eternity, and from God's perspective, you were. So God loved you with an everlasting love. He looked forward in time, and guess who he saw? He saw you, Deborah, Tom, Melinda, Sylvia, Dee, Mary. He saw you from eternity, and he loved you. He chose you before he created this world. First step in the golden chain of salvation goes way, way back. Back before the creation of the world, back before you even heard the gospel. Uh, and, or, or believed. God foreknew you. He chose you before you ever chose him. Some people say, well, I, I, I accepted Jesus. Well, you, yes, but God had to accept you first, okay? Had to choose you first. So the next link in this chain is predestination. Let's quickly review what that means. Uh, 
God predestined you. That's what it says in our text. Paul said in verse 29, For those God foreknew, he also predestined. Once again, uh, well, let me back up and say this. Once God chose you for salvation, he also predestined you for ultimate glory. Now, predestination simply means this. Everyone whom God saves is going to make it to heaven. Everyone. He does not save you to ultimately die. He, got, he does not save you and hope you make it to heaven. He saves you to be in heaven. When you buy a ticket, uh, a plane ticket, you have a destination, right? Um, if all goes well, you will make it to your destination and hopefully on time. Your ticket marks out your destination. You're going to uh, Timbuktu, wherever you want to go. I don't know. Uh, your, your ticket says that you're going to California. That's your destination. Uh, it tells you in advance what your destination, that's called your predestination. Everyone God foreknows or chooses, he also gives them a ticket to the destination called what? Heaven. That's where you're going. It's your predestination. He predestined them there. And their destiny is secure even if the flight is bumpy. How many of you have been on some bumpy flights? We're talking about your life being a bumpy flight. How many of you, or even if there's some turbulence on the way, how many of you have had some turbulence in your life? So, but who is still in control? God is. So you can trust that he will land the plane and it will arrive right on time. It's never late. He said, but no, Pastor, I was, I was planning to get there in about, uh, in about another 10 years. God said, no, 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 I want you now. So it's not according to your timetable. It's God's timetable. It will never be late. You arrive, when you arrive and see Jesus, you say, oh, you're just on time. <laughs> I was expecting you. Right on time. So those God foreknew, he also predestined. And we, saw, we see the same sequence in Ephesians 1.11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is doing it all. God for knowing God's foreknowing you simply tells you that you were chosen by God. God chose you. God predestining you tells you what God chose you for. He chose you for a purpose. Now Paul tells us exactly what that purpose is. God predestined you to be made like Jesus. Verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That conforming, that's, a, that's, that's nothing but sanctification. That's what's going on in your life. You know, God, is, he, he expects you to go through some stuff. He expects you to go through trials and difficulty, but it's molding you. It's fashioning you. It's conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. So the good news is that God has predestined all believers to be made just like Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn. And as a believer, you've been adopted into God's family. God wants to make you just like your older brother. Jesus died to make you just like him. It's the purpose for which we've been called or chosen. And God will make it happen. He's going to make it happen. It's your destiny destiny. So let's go back to that golden chain. Number one, God foreknew you. Number two, God predestined you. The first two links in the chain happened before you were even here. Before the world was created. Okay? But this link takes place in time. In other words, uh, it's happening right now, but it's already been decided in eternity. Uh, so let's look at that next link. 
God called you. Verse 30, those whom those he predestined, he also called. Now we saw this back in verse 28, where believers are destined or described rather as those who are called according to his purpose. God called you to himself. He called you to Jesus. He called you to become a Christian. Uh, there are two types of calling in the Bible. You see it over and over again. Two types of calling we find in the scriptures. What we might call an outward calling and the other we call an inward calling. The outward calling is God's general call or invitation that goes out to everybody. Okay? On the airwaves. Telling everybody. We tell the gospel. We tell the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. But not everybody, not everyone responds to this call as there are many people who hear the gospel, many people who hear the gospel but don't believe. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You can preach, you can preach it until the cows come home. They don't, want, they don't believe it. This is why the Bible, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Chosen. You are a believer because you are chosen. Okay? That word called there is used in a sense uh, in the sense of the outward general call that goes out to everyone when he says many are called but few are chosen. That's what it is, an outward call. But the Bible also talks about an inward call. This, uh, and this is the main way the word called is used in the scripture. We sometimes uh, call this inward call an effectual, effectual call because it has its desired effect. The person whom God calls inwardly responds to the gospel and believes. You believe or are a believer because of God's effectual call. You respond to the, uh, to the call. We read about this inward call in Jude 1. To those who have been called who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Those who are called in this way are loved by God and kept by Jesus Christ. They are believers. If you are a believer, you have not only been called outwardly, but been called inwardly. That's why you are a believer. Now we find another example of this in 2 Timothy 1.9. It says, God saved and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Wow. I'm going through a lot of stuff that you really ought to think about what's going on here. That's the third link in this chain. Those God predestined, he also called inwardly. The next link in the chain is justification. Those God called, he also justified. Back to verse 30. Those who he called, he also justified. Or we could put it this way. Everyone God calls, he justifies. Everyone. Once again, this shows that Paul cannot be speaking about the outward calling uh, of the gospel because not everyone who hears the gospel believes. And if you don't believe, you're not going to be justified. Okay? God only justifies believers. Justification simply means to be declared righteous in his sight. If you don't believe, you're not going to be declared righteous. If you believe, he will justify. And he does, uh, he does this not on the basis of your works, your performance, but simply because of your faith in Christ. Okay? Faith in Christ. That's part of believing. When you believe in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and God declares you righteous in his sight. So here's a sequence that's taking place here. God calls, we believe. God justifies. That's the sequence. God calls, 
We believe, he justifies. You don't believe, you don't get to justification. Why would he justify somebody that's not going to believe him? Belief, 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 belief is mentioned a lot of times in the scriptures, you know. You got to believe. God does the calling and the justifying. All we do is believe. Believing is your part in your salvation. God does everything else. And when I say believing, I'm, really talk, I'm talking also faith. It mixed in with that. So the final link in this chain, and we're almost done, the final link in this chain is glorification, or as many of you would like to hear, in heaven, okay? Uh, those God justify, he glorifies. Glorification simply means that you are finally like Jesus. When Jesus returns, you will receive your new resurrected body just like Christ, just like him. Your sinful nature will be obliterated. Say hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> and you will never, ever, ever sin again. Say thank you, Lord. <laughs> Woo, you won't have simple thoughts, words, or deeds. Now, I know, Pastor, you, talk, you curse a lot all the time, don't you, Pastor? Tom? So, but you won't be doing that anymore, Tom. It'll be over. I'm kidding. I pick on Tom because he's an easy target right there. We know he, we know he doesn't curse. Uh, you will be glorified with Christ and enjoy perfection. Enjoy perfect, uninterrupted fellowship with God in his presence forever. God will do this for every believer because verse 30 says, all those God justifies, he also glorifies. Your future glory is as certain as though it's already happened. In fact, from God's point of view, it has already happened. Now, you may, now you may have noticed that even though glorification is something that takes place in the future, Here's how Paul speaks of it. He speaks of it as something that happened in the past. He said he doesn't say those God justified, he will also glorify. He doesn't say that, does it? He says those God justified, he also glorified. It's done. It's already done. It was done, it was done in eternity past. We're looking at things from God's point of view. Why speak of it in the past tense about, why speak in the past tense about something that doesn't play, take place into the future? The reason is because your future glory is as certain as if it already happened. As far as we are concerned, yes, our glorification is in the future, but as far as God is concerned, it's as good as done. Every now and then you need to stop and look at it from God's point of view. Okay, that gives you peace of mind, doesn't it? As far as God is concerned, in Christ, it's already happened. Christ has already been glorified. You all agree with that? So, since Christ has already been glorified, where are you in this equation? Can somebody tell me? Where? You're in who? So what happened to Christ happened to you. It's done. If he rose, you rose. It's all in Christ because you are in him. Okay? He's already been glorified. And see, since you are united with Christ, that's also in the book of Romans, all that happened to Jesus Christ also happened, past tense, to you. So as a believer, <coughs> excuse me, you don't have to worry or wonder about your future. You know, I, it, 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 it drives me nuts when I hear Christians say, boy, I hope I get to heaven. <laughs> what? Because that's a person that's looking at it from your point of view. You need to say, I thank God my eternal reward isn't based on me. In Christ, I'm going, I'm in heaven. Your future is secure in Christ. As Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. God started it. He's going to finish it. 
God works all things for good for believers. And this is how God works out his good purpose for your salvation. Here's the five steps. We're done. God foreknew you. God predestined you. God called you. God justified you. God already has glorified you. You see, when it comes to your salvation, my dear brothers and sisters, God started in the beginning, and he works his way forward. We start in the middle with faith in Christ. Okay, I'm, I believe. I'm on board. <laughs> and so we have full assurance of our salvation in Christ. Let's wrap this up. There are some who don't get this. And many don't get it who are not believers. They won't get it. I hope you get it. And I believe if you are a believer, you do get it. These are some of the most wonderful verses in the Bible. God works all things for our good. He can take the very worst things in your life and work them for your good. And the most important of all these things is that God, that God works for good. The greatest thing in the world for your good is your salvation. It's more important than the job you have who you marry, how much money you make, your car you ride, the house you live in, it, the car you drive. It, it, this is more important than anything else, your salvation. He's working that all out. Why would he leave? This? He might, he, okay, he might let you pick out a car. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, he doesn't mess around with your salvation. This is his doing. Before he created the world, God saw and he chose you. He handpicked you. He wrote out the ticket with your name and your destination. He built the plane. He's the pilot. It's the same thing I said last week. He's the pilot and he's the co-pilot. So some people think, well, if we're doing it, God. We got, you know, I, I, I just, sometimes we say, well, I'm just let God take the wheel. You let him take the wheel. You better keep your hands off the wheel. You got nothing. <laughs> no, he has the wheel and the, the co-pilot wheel. He's in control of this situation. And he's the air traffic controller. He controls the weather, all the elements outside, all the outside force that he controls. He is going to land the plane at the proper destination right on time. Okay? If you are in Christ, you are forever safe, forever secure. Don't you worry about a thing. Okay? <laughs> you don't need to be afraid because God is the one. Hallelujah. God is the one who works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his divine purpose. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you so much for the simplicity of the word of God. If we just kind of slow it down a little bit and just learn from the teachings of the scriptures. Thank you, God in heaven, that you did not leave salvation up to us. Thank you, God in heaven, that this is a God thing. And you have taken it from beginning to end. And thank you for blessing us to be the recipients of this wonderful gift. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everything you do for us, God in heaven. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to say anything to even uh, say that somehow or the other we did it with you. We didn't. Lord, if you had left it in our hands, we would have blown it before, at the moment of our birth. But God, you didn't. Adam and Eve blew it at the moment of the creation, we would have been the same way. And we, and, 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 but yet, you took this in eternity past and started the process. Thank you. Thank you so much. We just ask that you will bless us to remember it, to meditate on it, to, in, uh, to embrace it, and to thank you every day for your wonderful purpose in our lives. And that we are blessed to be according, to live our lives according to your purpose. And now we want to ask that your blessings be upon the offering that will be collected today. That it will be used for kingdom work that more and more people will know Jesus and become believers. Become believers. 
We thank you. We bless you. We ask it in Jesus' name today. Amen. Good afternoon to all of you again. <clears throat> I remember years ago when I was a college student and I was reading that passage in Romans chapter 8. Um, like many of you, I read it from Lloyd Garrett's point of view. Uh, and my focus was always on things working out. And I just always believed things will work out okay, and so on and so on. Um, so often in the Bible, you got to understand that that God is in control of your life. And most of all, he's in control of your destiny. And when you start looking at what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, it, will, it can change your whole perspective on a lot of things in the scriptures. Because you start relying and trusting in what you can do, or what you can accomplish, or what you can live up to. Because if you focus on that, we, we're miserable failures. But if you focus on what God does and what God does for you, what God is doing for you and did for you even before you were born. It's a, and, and, and what I like about that when, it, when I talk about eternity past, that he foreknew you and that he called you, that, that means that there was zero human effort involved here, wasn't it? Because no. you weren't even around to put forth any effort. God has done it all. And yet, when we think about this table that we are about to participate in, that's another example of God doing. God sent, chose Jesus before the foundation of the world to come enter into our world. He came in, in eternity. He chose him to enter into time to fulfill 
what was decided on in eternity to come and die for us on the cross bled and died and to be resurrected for us all of this was done for us why because he loves us and it's really an affront to God to say well, let me do my part we have nothing to offer, do we? We have nothing to offer except, Lord, I believe what you did for me. Amen. And I thank you for what you've done for me. It's humbling, isn't it? it is. In America, it's humbling. You know, we're in the, we like to try to work things out together. We have a God who loves us so much, family. He loves you so much that he made this table possible. He made the bread, the bread and the wine his broken body, his shed blood, possible, so that you will be ultimately glorified. That chain doesn't even start. <laughs> it started in eternity past. God did it all for us. That's a wonderful gift, isn't it? Amen. A wonderful blessing. And I want you to partake of this uh, the symbols today reflect on what God has done and how much he loves you so much. I mean, if somebody, we live in a world where many people are just tossed to the curb. Uh, people who don't feel loved. But boy, I tell you, nobody's going to love you like Jesus. Amen. Nobody, nobody's going to love you like your father who made you. And then think about all the stuff you may have gone through in your life. You wonder, how can anybody love me? Amen. Maybe you had parents that abused you. I don't know. I'm not minimizing that. I'm just saying, no matter what you have ever gone through before, don't ever forget that God, your father, Jesus, your brother, loves you so much that they put this whole process in motion so that you and I, all of us, might have eternal life, glorification, heaven. It's all the same thing. That's what God has done. So we're going to thank him for what he's done. I mean really thank him as we ask the blessing on the bread and the wine. Pastor. Our glorious and compassionate daddy in heaven. Hallelujah. Just hallelujah. Praise. Praise you. We praise you for your plan of salvation. Lord, it's so humbling. You are such a gracious God, and we don't deserve it. But Lord, you know what? It's simply based on your awesome love for us. Your awesome love for us. Thank you so much for your plan of salvation. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for choosing us. What a glorious thing this is. Let us just take this in, Lord. As we think about Jesus, you coming for the forgiveness of our sins, you willingly went to the cross for us. Daddy God chose you, and it was a done deal. You never looked back, Jesus. All you thought about was us and how much you love us and how much you wanted fellowship with us and how much you wanted us to be with you eternally. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for your broken body, which is symbolized by the bread. And thank you so much for your shed blood on Calvary's cross, which is symbolized by the grape juice and the wine. We are, Lord, the most blessed people on the face of the earth to call you Daddy, to call you, Lord, our Savior, to call you our friend. You mean so much to us. May we, Lord, in our small way, do our part to share the gospel of what Jesus has done for us to others. So we give you thanks for this table of remembrance. We thank you for everything. 
that you have provided because you've done it all. We did nothing. You did it all. You made it all possible. We thank you, we love you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. If you could take up the little kit that you have, hopefully you've been able to use these by now. Hopefully professionals at this. <laughs> I'm probably the only one to ever struggle with this thing. Take the wafer. Thank you, Lord, for the suffering you went through for our benefit, for my benefit. Just say, for my benefit. For me. I didn't deserve it, but you did it for me. Thank you. In Jesus' name. second part is where I have the most struggle <laughs> and all I, can, all I can think about is I have to face D if I spill this on this table <laughs> that's all I think about right now that's my struggle right now <laughs> okay everybody this is what Jesus did for us his blood was shed on Calvary he entered our humanity, took the punishment that was meant for us, ultimately to death, it was for me. Say it was for me. He's your substitute. He took your place. You and I deserve to die. He took our place. Thank you, in Jesus' name. If you have difficulty understanding God's love and how much he loves you, go back and read the example where Jesus ate uh, with sinners because they were the outcast. They were the least loved in society. And Jesus went to them. These are people who were thought of as if they, if they were outcasts in their society, they must have been outcasts in heaven. Jesus went to them, the lowest of lows. That's how much he loves you. Because that's us, when you really think about it. We have fooled ourselves into think that we deserve heaven, but the fact of the matter is none of us deserve it. That's why it's a wonderful gift of God. Praise him for what he's done. Let's give him a hand, praise saints. And I thank you for being a believer. Because together, we were being molded and fashioned to be just like Jesus. And we're going to be there together for all eternity. What a wonderful blessing. Amen. That's salvation. Amen. Thank you. Ushers, if you can come forward. Have your cups prepared. sir thank you family
Good afternoon. All right, there we go. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, family. Mm -hmm. If we can all rise and sing honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you for that, Pastor, sir. I mean, for that word, Pastor. It's amazing how God works. I was just talking to the pastor earlier about the same thing that he talked about in his sermon, how God uses things in our lives to help other people. So whatever you're going through, trust me. You can go through it with God, and you are here to help other people go through yes. it also. Amen. So praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Go ahead, Bob. Hit it, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Worthy is the man.
gotta see this, brother. You gotta see this. You are right now in this great heavenly throne room right now. The thrones have been placed. The Father is seated. Jesus at the right hand. The heavenly host right now shouting. die on the cross for us, another person. Uh, Tom, would you do that for me? No? No, okay. No. Could, could you even think about it for me? Man, come on. <laughs> Can you just give us some thought for a second? Jennifer, would you die on the cross for me? <laughs> yeah, at least she thought about it, but we get the, we get the same answer from everybody, though. No. That, that's what blows me away, when you understand that the, what the Bible talks about in Philippians, get the right chapter, uh, the humiliation of Jesus, where he, from the highest high to the lowest low, uh, I mean, it's incredible. He did it for love. So because if you wonder, well, how much that God loves you, that's love, isn't it? That's an amazing love, that somebody could love us that much. While we were yet sinners, the Bible says in Romans, Christ died for us. So it's not like we stepped up to the plate and got it right. We were messing up big time. Messing up big time. Yet he died for us because he loves us that much. We are a blessed people. God has truly been good to us. He foreknew you. He called you. He justified you. Glorified you. Well, I left out predestination. We got that's in there too. He did it all. Long before he created the world, he was already in motion. Why? Because he loves us. So we are blessed. So what I'd ask is that you leave here knowing that somebody loves you and nobody loves you like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for the fact that we are a blessed people loved by you. And you've demonstrated your love for us by sending your only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. You demonstrated your love for us, Jesus, by willingly going to the cross for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the word today. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on things from the eternal perspective, from our perspective of our Father. Thank you, God in heaven, for bringing us into it all in time to now participate in what you have already started and doing and finished in eternity past. Thank you so much for everything. God in heaven, may we never forget it. May we always reflect on it. May we always thank you for what you have done and tell others about what Jesus does for us. And then if it's your will, to call them not only outward but inwardly. And they truly will love and respond to the love of Jesus in the same way that we have by being believers. Saints, as you go forth, don't forget who you are. That you are a believer and therefore you are a special person. Specially loved by God. That he loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. May God bless you. May you never forget it. May you praise him. May you honor him, may you worship him, and truly, truly be a, a, an example, a reflection of what it means to be a Christian who loves God and called according to his purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.